much. Thanks. Wow, it's wonderful. I, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, nice time from uh, um, Great to hear from you. We'll, we'll be looking into the chat later on. Uh, but I think we can, we can start with our session today. Uh, people are still coming, so I will, I will take it slow, but already for those who are here, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you all here uh, for today's roundtable open discussion. This event is organized by the Food for Thought organization and uh, Food Drink Europe, uh, who helped us uh, to secure some, some fantastic speakers that I'm going to introduce to you in a minute. Uh, I will be your host today. My name is Joanna. I'm a TFF ambassador here in Belgium. Uh, I'm, an, uh, I'm also a senior manager within the Food and Health Science uh, at the European Food Information Council. Uh, that's by day, by night. I'm also passionate about developing um, leaders within the food sector. So today's topic is about millennials and Generation Z. As you know, these young adults are born between 1981 and 2012. That's quite a large spread, but um, this is just how the, the generations are being described. Uh, and we will discuss today their impact on the future of food and drink. So prior to this event, I've been doing some reading and I found out that it's estimated that there are about 1.8 billion millennials that's one fourth of the of the entire global population, um, which which is quite mind blowing when you think about it that way. And for them, food is more than just uh, basic human needs. You know, the one we learned at at school from the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Food, probably next to the internet, is the second most important thing. It's it's passion. It's something that people can identify themselves with. And sharing uh, what we eat, what we drink, uh, it, it became a normal or daily routine for, for many of us, uh, whether it's on social media or with family or friends. Uh, you can use the, the, you know, the reaction option here on Zoom and, and put your hands up if you, if you have taken a photo of, of the food you've eaten in the past week or two. I certainly have uh, quite a few of them. Apologies for the Brussels noise. Um, so yeah, I, I also read about, uh, this has been research done about uh, social media used by the millennials. And it showed that nearly 50% of online debates uh, between millennials in the US and France are about food. So these young adults put food at the top of the interest list and that naturally is changing the entire food system. So having that background in mind, uh, what changes do we see? How the industry is responding to them and what opportunities this brings to uh, food and drink innovators will be a focus of our one hour session today. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, and I think we have a majority or, or more, a lot more people now, um, I would like to introduce you to our wonderful speakers and guests uh, firstly, uh, we'll, our main speaker of the day is Robert de Brede, uh, Executive Vice President of Global Food at Unilever. Uh, Robert has over 20 years experience at the organization uh, and over the years he held various positions uh, uh, within marketing and sales roles um, across Europe and Africa. Then uh, after a while, I see Tina talking indeed, you hear Robert. Uh, then we will open the discussion to two other uh, panelists. We have Tina Chen, a founder and chief tea officer at Humanity, a healthy tea beverage so social enterprise, as well as Dan Dalton, a former British member of the European Parliament, currently a CEO of the British Chamber of Commerce to the EU and Belgium, as well as an advisor for the Allied for Startups. I hope I get all the names and affiliations correct. Uh, I'm so happy to have you uh, all here. 
and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Uh, before we start, I also would like to thank our audience for participating in today's event, for tuning in from what we now know is all over the world, from mornings to, to evenings at various places. Uh, please share your thoughts in the chat box, uh, share your views, your opinions, but also ask questions that we will try to address with the panelists towards the end of the session. So, without further ado, uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Robert because uh, 20 years of experience in the industry uh, probably, probably gave you uh, a lot of insights. So I would be curious to start with knowing how have diets changed over the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Mm. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. And um, uh, that's a difficult question to answer because it depends very much, of course, which lens does one look through? Do we take a European lens or do we take, uh, you mentioned I also spent some time in Africa or maybe even India. Um, um, but, you know, commonly speaking, you do see that food has become much more than indeed only the nutritional intake uh, that we're taking. Yeah? Um, I think Instagramming our food pictures has really visualized that, but food has become a connector. It is cultural, it is, you know, social gathering. Um, and some trends that we were seeing was that people were becoming more conscious on what they were eating, whether that was leading for a desire on more healthier propositions, whether that was leading for more plant-based kind of propositions because people, you know, didn't want to lean on the animal protein and, and you know, what, what that would cause. Um, it has also led to people are more on the go and about. So rather than having all our meals and dinners and, and lunches and breakfast in the house, actually we saw a lot of consumption moving out of house and on the go even, so very much snacking propositions. Um, and I think now with COVID, you see that many of these trends are actually accelerating. Yeah, Maybe the on the go, of course, is suffering a bit of a hiccup at the moment because you know suddenly the whole out of home demand was forced to, to stop. Yeah? People you know, had to close restaurants and, and people were not commuting as much anymore, of course. But I'm quite confident that that will return uh, in, in one form or another. But specifically the demand for plant-based, uh, healthier propositions have, has significantly increased. At the same time, I think the first shock that we saw specifically in the Western markets, people were suddenly anxious again. We had taken food a bit as a commonality in terms of it's always available. Stores are open all the time, Monday till Sunday, even late at night. And even if the store would be closed, you would you get a delivery and you were eats and something would be delivered for your door. And suddenly people are saying, oh, that might stop now. Yeah. And we saw a bit of a shock in the system. Um, and I think that awareness is on one hand really good because it has shown actually our food system today is not the right kind of food system. If we also want to have a planet you know, that is comfortable and, 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 and socially acceptable to live on 50 years from now. So we need to make some changes in terms of sustainability, in terms of accessibility. And I think, you know, if anything good should come from COVID, it should be that we're accelerating that, uh, that change that, uh, that needs to come towards a more inclusive uh, food system yeah, and a more sustainable food system specifically. Yeah, yeah and, and you, you named a few things, you named being on the go, plant-based, uh, revolution or, or mm -hmm. so what impact does it have on on Unilever on the company or on the industry in general look um, we're a business so we need to make sure that you know um, we stay in business so we need to be on top of the trends and actually um, for those that know Unilever is not only a business that wants to sell a lot of course you know we've got very clear profit and turnover goals but we also believe that we need to be a purposeful business. Um, and if we want to have a business 50 years from now, you know, imagine our company is 100 years old. But if we continue to do what we do today, it will become very difficult to still be around in 100 years because you know, the resources are becoming more scarce. Um, so we need to drive some changes along. Yeah? Um, and that's again where the beauty also comes in because we are such a big company, we can also drive some of these changes specifically stimulating a more plant-based diet is something that uh, that is really motivating because it helps us to on one hand 
you know, drive the business in a healthy way forward, but it also helps us to build to that goal of, you know, becoming carbon neutral um, and making sure that we have, you know, regenerative agriculture in place. Um, so these are the nice kind of trends to, on one hand, embark on, on the other hand, even stimulate and drive ourselves. But it's a challenge, yeah, because it means that we need to change things. Um, you know, and, and we need to transform our portfolio and we need to stretch our brands in a way that they can do that in a credible way. And we need to do it in a way that, you know, the majority of the people can embark on this. And again, you know, very much from a Western opportunity, we sometimes tend to think that everybody has the money to be able to afford these transitions. But in the end, we need, you know, all 8 billion of us on this globe to be able to make this transformation. Um, and that means that we also need a food system that is accessible for everybody and not only for the wealthy few on uh, on this planet that could actually afford such transformation. Yeah. And speaking of this transformation, so what does it mean for the innovation of, of the company? I know that you have a, a, a nice and well-developed uh, research and development center at the Wageningen University. Yeah. So is uh, yeah what 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 is happening there like what yeah um, i think uh, it's a very common phrase but people are always saying you know the, the change the pace of change is constantly increasing and yet it will be, never be as slow as it was today yeah so it's going faster and faster and innovation is crucial to drive this transformation you know these trends that we were talking about you need innovation to be able to embark on that I think the realization that is there more and more today, and again, maybe a positiveness from COVID, that we come to the realization, everybody, that we can't do this alone. So where in the classical world, everybody was thinking, you know, I will solve this within my own chain, within my own, you know, company, and maybe one or two partners. And now you see that there's a whole ecosystem starting to arise. Um, and I think that's beautiful, yeah? And it, and it is really allowing us to, to drive that change to a much faster extent. Um, and whether it is, you know, partners that do something for one project and then separate again, or that it is long term, that's not really that relevant. And I think that's indeed the beauty of the new ecosystem that we've built and a deliberate choice, you know, to have our, our global research and development center in Wageningen, which is indeed the food valley, uh, you know, where a lot of um, uh, startups, uh, but also academic students, you know, and everybody's keeping each other sharp. So it doesn't mean we all speak the same language. But it does mean we can all build towards each other's strengths and, and, and use that network to drive the change that is, uh, that is needed. Yeah, yeah indeed. I, I think it's also about inspiration from one another and see what others are doing. And I, in a minute, I will, I will have a question for Tina as well, because she's one of those young innovators with, with ideas. Um, but before we go, uh, before we, we go there, what, uh, yeah, what, what is your relationship with young innovators? What, what do you do as a company to, to work together? Look, if, if you look back, it's often the younger generations that drive the change the hardest, right? Mm -hmm. um, they have newer views. They have less patterns that have been built in over the years. They are not accepting the status quo. And they, you know, fairly said, they are also much more dependent on what the future will bring because they will be in that future for a much longer time. Um, and in that sense, they challenge a bit, I think, you know, the older generations and, and, and the more established kind of companies. So in that sense, they are essential. Um, and, and, and you need these early adopters, these innovators, to show the way, yeah? Um, and I think that's also, if you now look at, you know, the, the tractions that many startups are getting because they are able to, you know, to penetrate into that, they've got an ID. And because of, you know, the internet and, 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 and the, the ability that people are now able to connect with each other and also willing to connect and participate is suddenly unlocking a magic and capabilities that, you know, 20 years from now were unthought of, yeah? Um, and in that sense, it's crucial, yeah? And even for big companies like the one that I work for, if you would ignore that, it's game over very rapidly. So, you know, the beauty I think lies in where we can use our scale and our knowledge built over the years, but are, are willing to be inspired or maybe even challenged by some of these new thinkers that are innovative and challenging the status quo and saying, well, actually, can we not do this differently, yeah? Um, and I think that's where the magic lies in, uh, in that sense. And sometimes it can be fine that it's confrontational, um, you know, but because that sets the scene sharp, yeah? 
Um, and, but I, I really see a lot coming out of that. Yeah, and our pace of innovation has stepped up since we've started to open up, um, you know, and, and share where we need help, where we see challenges and work, where we work together in that sense. What would it be? What would be the biggest challenges? Uh, well, I think at this point of time, you see that if we're talking, you know, specifically about food, uh, we're still dependent on, you know, a very small number of crops globally to, uh, to feed the world. Yeah. So three crops in this world are approximately responsible for 70% of the calorie intake that we take. Yeah. Um, now that seems maybe very efficient. Uh, but the earth is not able to regenerate if we only focus on these crops. So we need a much wider biodiversity in order to have a planet that is also still capable to grow the amount of food we need 50 years from now. Um, and that is something I think that, you know, that is a challenge to all of us because it means that we need to, you know, be more diverse um, and, and think of other food kind of products to drive indeed that biodiversity in a scale that it really ma uh, makes the difference. Yeah. And, and the plant-based transition is a big part of that, but not the only one, because if all our protein would move from animal protein to soy protein, we would still have a biodiversity problem. So also there, we would need to look into, you know, how can we build that diversity so that we can come to a, a fully sustainable model. Yeah. Um, that's a big challenge that we have had. It's, it's doable. We know what needs to be done, but we need to, again, we need to do it in a way that we are able to embark all 8 billion of us. And not only, I'm sorry for saying that, but you know, all of us that are able to join this conference now on a beautiful device connected to the internet, um, it's easier for us to do. For many of the people that are living in other places, you know, more remote, less economically developed, that's more difficult to do. So we need to also make sure that we keep that food system inclusive and accessible to everybody, because otherwise we don't get the scale to make the change that we need. Yeah, and that brings us back to what you said before. It's a, it's a teamwork, if you like. It's a global teamwork for all the elements to, to come together and play, play the role. Yeah, and it's an ask to the marketeers, maybe if I could make that plea, because this should not be about uh, you shall do this because otherwise that, you know, that works for, 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 for a certain population, but not for the mass. So for the rest, we need to make this easy, accessible, enjoyable, tasteful. So it should not feel like a pain to do this. It should be a joy to do this. It should be logical to do this. It should be the easy thing to do. Yeah. So, you know, not expensive, not four hour cooking for a dinner. It should all be accessible, available and easy and then fun. And then the magic will come. Yeah, just a more of a natural natural flow rather than uh, exactly thinking process. That's very interesting. Um, and and just to touch a little bit on on that question before I asked about you know we're thinking about the changes and what what other changes do you see coming um, in the next year or two in terms of the, the food market and food industry. Well, um, uh, I expect that the, the trends that I mentioned before that they will continue. Um, I kind of expect and also personally hope, of course, that we will see that on the go and that blurring of the channels, as we tended to call it, that that will come back so that people will be able to indeed, you know, have food on the go again also and, 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 and that kind of consumption. Um, and I hope that we will see many changes that are driving indeed this food system transformation. Um, so more plant based, more biodiverse. Um, less with, you know, with less carbon impact, uh, more conscious choices in that line, more healthier diets. Because it's kind of funny that, you know, 2 billion people in this world are estimated to be obese. Close to 1 billion go to bed hungry. 30% of our food is thrown away. So somewhere the math doesn't square. Yeah, There is enough food in the world already produced today to feed everybody properly. The problem is that a large amount of that food that's being produced is actually being used to feed animals which we then again consume for a large part, yeah? And, and, and we need to make a few interventions because otherwise this model will not last for the next 50 years, yeah? yeah. Um, but it is definitely doable, yeah? But we need to make it in a way that it's easy. People want to embark on this, yeah? And not only yeah. the convicted ones, which is nice, but we need the larger 80%. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with this paradox, and it is a paradox. So uh, that, that needs to be tackled. On the plant-based front, uh, as I said before, Tina, I, I would like to invite you to perhaps answer or oh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. You uh, you created a brand uh, of the plant-based drinks. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what inspired you to, to, to create Humanity? Yes, of course. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. And I think Robert pointed out some very interesting facts and I just learned so much from what he was saying earlier. And so I started Humanity because I wanted to create a healthier alternative to current soft drinks on the market. I myself am an avid tea drinker. I love drinking tea. And from my own personal cultural background, I'm from Taiwan and I grew up in the US. And in Taiwan, there is a drink called bubble tea that's very popular, our milk tea. And when I moved to the US, I found that it was also very popular in the community that I lived in Los Angeles. And I continued drinking that during my childhood. And then when I moved to London, I saw that, oh, bubble tea is also very popular here. So the concept is inspired by a milky tea and it can be an alternative to coffee lattes or energy drinks because tea actually provides caffeine without the crash of coffee caffeine. So it gives you all of those benefits. But the main reason is I wanted to tackle two major problems, which is one problem like uh, Robert pointed out earlier which is obesity. And one of the main causes of obesity is actually due to sugary soft drinks. And so for our drink is low sugar. We use very natural ingredients. It's all organic and fair trade. And so this is, for example, the tea. And the tea is inside here now. We just found our factory recently. So very excited for that. And then we use oat milk. Oat milk is one of the most eco-friendly milks available. So talking about sustainability, that's one of the main reasons we chose it. It uses the uh, one of the least amount of water as well as emits some of the least amount of carbon emissions. So definitely oat milk is a good alternative to dairy, for example. And yeah, that's two of the main reasons. And also the second reason is to um, encourage people to take tea breaks because we're so stressed from work these days. Uh, we are so busy and just always on the go. It's good to take breaks. And so our motto is to encourage people to take me time, tea time, anytime. <laughs> and also it's self-care September, so everyone takes some breaks. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I feel like, you know, doing my research before this, uh, this session, I feel you're really ticking all of the boxes of organic, sustainable, everything that it's been, uh, um, you know, highly desired just now or in demand. So uh, did you actually do a, a market research prior to um, to starting your business and how did you do it? Yeah, so I did my MBA at Imperial College Business School. So that's in London. And I was part of the entrepreneurial space there. It's called the Enterprise Lab. And I used their space to do a blind taste test. So I brought the samples that I had made myself along with other popular brands that I found and just to get feedback on the taste. And once I got um, good feedback on, you know, whether to make it sweeter or less sweet, um, stronger tea taste, etc., I was able to refine the product and make it better over time. And once I had everything set up, then I went to the farmer's market. So I got myself a commercial kitchen. I got certified as a food business got all the insurance in place and then contacted farmers markets and then went there to start selling there. Because I find one of the best ways to see if there is a market and there is an interest in your product is to see if people will part with their money um, to purchase your product. And so by selling in farmers markets, I got feedback along the way and also got to sell my products and show that there is traction. That's, that's very clever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tina, and also thank you, Robert. And now I kind of want to open the door to, to all of you, so please jump in if you feel like, uh, like it. Um, what else do you see happening? What else do you see, uh, what's the future of food and drink sector? 
look, I look. The, the future is a bit what we make of it together, right? So um, let's not pre let's not pretend that this is going to happen to us and we can just sit there. That's a choice, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I think you know the good thing I think is that we see more and more people that are taking a stand and that you know are willing to intervene, yeah. Um, and I think for those that um, um, that are a bit you know further away. It needs to be made easier, um, yeah. And we need to, you know, tell the story on what is needed, and we need to make this fun and enjoyable. Yeah. The easiest transformation is when people can embark on it without having the feeling that they're leaving things behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They need to actually feel that they are getting new things, new possibilities, new mm -hmm. diets, new uh, better health. Um, you know, great tasting meals, having the same kind of social engagements, um, and 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 I see that tendency. And, and again. I think we have an obligation. COVID has brought so much pain and so much, you know, economical despair. Let's at least use this, you know, the awareness that it has created for food systems, for the impact of sustainability, the fact that we humans need to also take a bit more action in our own hands to make sure that, you know, we take care of this planet and each other. Let's use that positive momentum. Yeah? And I see a lot of, I'm an optimist, so I see a lot of, you know, positive developments at this point of time. I've never seen the interest in plant-based diets so enormous at this point of time. The consciousness on, you know, environmental choices to uh, to be coming. I think we need to watch out. There is always a tendency to overmarket this. Mm. So you know, greenwashing very popular. What is really you know sustainable? Uh, sometimes people people also fear to make a first step because we're still working on something. So seventy percent recycled is maybe not good enough, but it's still better than not at all recycled. So. You know, we need to make sure that we don't kill the right initiatives with our, which are not perfect yet, but we also need to make sure that we drive people to go for that perfectness, yeah, and not just settle. Mm -hmm. I now have a claim that people like, so I can stop doing, uh, you know, the further fine-tuning and future-proofing. So, and I think that's where we have to create the network and, and keep each other responsible uh, and responsive in, uh, in that sense, yeah, so... Um, but I see a lot of in great initiatives and, and, you know, we need to drive them faster. Yeah, I hear you, Robert. I, and I hear you saying as or speaking about, you know, initiatives, about people, people involved in innovation, people are also consumers. But then there's also one big player, which is uh, the, the, the policy makers who are also involved uh, in or, or should be involved in the whole uh, uh, game, let's say. Uh, do you, what's your opinion, uh, all of you? What do you think is, do we have enough or good enough environment for young innovators or innovators in general or industry to, um, to work together towards these common goals? I think Dan is probably best place to kick that one off, I would say. Yeah. They're also I'm looking a yes. view on that, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, well, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I mean, it's, I think it's difficult because you generally policymakers, uh, you know, this isn't always at the front of the agenda. They're trying to manage a whole huge number of things. And most policymakers are generalists. So they don't necessarily have the expert knowledge that we've heard from, from Robert and Tina. And so therefore it's always difficult. I think trying to, to, to get a message like this across to policymakers. Um, first thing I would say, just looking at some of the questions as well, um, because there was a question about does the EU do enough to to support food innovation? I think that's quite a good way into this because um, the EU policy on food, of course, is is you know a big common agricultural policy that pays a lot of money towards existing farm systems. It has a certain proportion of the money that's going towards rural development and trying to build some innovation, sustainability, these sort of things. But what that lacks, and I think it's probably the same with most of these public interventions in food systems around the world is the next stage, you know, the innovation, the adding value, the, um, that side of it, the sort of stuff that, that, that Tina has done. And I think that's where we're looking then for entrepreneurs to come in and, and try and uh, make that step and, and build on the feelings actually that you get amongst consumers, that they want things that are more sustainable, they want to waste less, they want shorter supply chains generally, they want all of these things. And actually policymakers can do so much but I really think the key is in encouraging the entrepreneurs to do that. Um, and there's a couple of things that I'd say just, you know, from the startup work that I've done uh, that, that sees on this things like, um, you know, uh, access to finance, uh, ensuring that, for example, stock options, um, 
uh, for young entrepreneurs aren't taxed at the time that the stocks are given, but more when they're sold. This is a real problem in, in most European countries. Um, startup visas as well, so entrepreneurs can actually get around the world and, 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 and scale up across the world. Um, these are all a few things that feed into that. Um, but generally, I'd say it's difficult for policymakers because they're focused in you know, trying to keep everything as it is because they will have lots of different constituencies coming to them. And food in particular is one of the most controversial policies. As a policymaker, you need to make sure, first of all, that there's enough food for, for your constituents. And in different parts of the world, that's different challenges. You know, the, the richer countries will subsidize food production. Um, those countries that aren't so rich are often looking at trying to make sure that they can get enough sources of that food. And so I think um, there's lots that fill into this. I could talk a lot more about it, but that would just be a, you know, a general introduction. Yeah, and what uh, one thing that I picked up on was the, you know the visas for traveling, and that also brings me to Roberts, where you know we we should all working together, we should open the borders to be able to uh, to, to act and to to be able to do uh, things in harmony. Is that something that you think is possible, and if so, how? Yeah, definitely, I think. One of the first, you know, maybe logical reactions when, when, when COVID hit, you know, and countries were locking down, you saw suddenly a discussion going on, uh, including on government levels. How do we secure our food supply? And have we not given away too much? Uh, you know, and are we too dependent on trade? And, and you know, let's keep our, our own food for ourselves. Um, and I'm, I'm quite happy that luckily that started to fade away again because people start to realize actually, that's not going to happen. If you look back in history, food resilience comes from food beyond borders. Yeah, um, there's a reason that certain crops are grown in certain places because the yield is much higher. Yeah, um, and the fact that we're able to trade that actually allows us to be less, you know, uh, vulnerable when an incident hits because crops go bad, weather turns bad. You know, things happen in that sense, and then you don't want to be isolated. You want to be able to trade. Um, we also need that kind of efficiency to make food accessible for everybody. And accessible, I mean also in that sense, affordable. Yeah, so uh, that needs to happen. I think, uh, so in that sense, it's good that the policy makers also make sure that that is stimulated and not the vice versa. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think we do see, I, you know, I really like the initiative that the European Union is taking with the Green Deal. And I know there's a lot of criticism in terms of, mm, is that not too ambitious? Is it really possible? You know, I would be more worried if we would set a target that we already know how to achieve because then we're probably not going to move fast enough and you need to challenge people to really think differently because if that's the target that's needed then we're not going to get there by five percent reduction every year we need to change things dramatically yeah um, so in that sense i think it's very good that those policies are being made and you see a lot of positive interventions where government is stimulating the work of entrepreneurs young startups and really helping to drive that innovation part. Yeah? And I think that's where the money from government should go. We still see a lot of subsidies on fossil fuels, on animal protein production, which is explained from the history. Um, but you know, there's always a part of history that one drags along that is very painful. But you know, at some point you will need to change. And I hope that you know now with, again, with COVID, you know, and we're doing so many economical stimulations for the right reasons, this is also our chance to say, okay, but let's then put the majority of that money to drive initiatives that also help us to drive that Green Deal agenda, to help us drive that transformation that we need to do. That's the kind of innovation that we should stimulate. That's where the money should go towards, you know? Um, you know and, and, and it does mean we need to let go of a few things that have become part of our normal system. That's gonna be painful, but we'd better do it faster than later, in my view. Yeah. And we suffer the same in our company. Yeah? I mean, I also sell, sell products where we would say that doesn't fit within our future vision. Yeah, I could even stop producing that today, but the demand won't go away. So my best thing to do is actually to offer portfolio transformation that I can migrate consumers. Yeah, um, And that's what we're doing a lot. That's the work that we're doing with our plant-based agenda. That's why we're bringing plant-based propositions to market. That's why we're partnering with food restaurants like Burger King supplying them with you know vegetarian alternatives for their whoppers and the challenge is if we make them taste just as good then we have a chance to convert 
Yeah. Without that, it's, you know, people feel, oh, you know, today's my plant based day. So I'm going to walk around with a face like this the whole day. That's not necessary. Yeah. Yes. And also bringing the cultural tra tradition aspects to it for, for people to, to enjoy it as much as they enjoy the, their usual food, right? Exactly. Or even more. <laughs> exactly. And actually, I, I'm already looking slowly through the questions. Uh, and on that, there is a question. Do you think we will still be eating meat in 2050? Uh, look, I think that will be the case. I would hope it would be significantly less. Yeah. So. You know, if, if, if I believe the, the majority of the experts, they say if we would balance towards one third of our proteins that we need as humans, would we, you know, if, if, if only one third max would come from animal proteins, then we would be able to come to that, you know, that regenerative uh, uh, agricultural footprint. Um, so there is still land where it is very good, you know, that, that, that there are animals and you could also say if those animals are there, they can be consumed. But we need to make sure that we do not go to beyond that tipping point yeah um and ideally if we make plant-based attractive enough it will not even be difficult to reach that one third and we might even end up with much much less yeah um so um, i would not bet on zero but i think we can achieve a third and then we would be in a good place um. yeah if i can come in here i think this is really interesting because you know of course in the west in europe and and, and the us you know, I think you're going to see a gradual reduction in, in the amount of meat that's being eaten. That's definitely true. But I think in the developing world, maybe the opposite is going to be true over the next 10, 10 20 years, because, you know, there is an aspirational value about eating meat. You see that, you know, we've seen that particularly in China in, in, in the years when the population got richer and richer. The first sort of thing they were looking for was meat, and uh, uh, certain elements of the Western diet. And I think it's that aspirational um, thing. So I think globally, you know, as hopefully, once we get out of COVID, the global economy starts going again, and hopefully more people are, are, are brought out of um, poverty and into the middle classes, I think you'll see there'll probably be more of a demand uh, for me. At the same time, that'll probably be dropping in, in, in the West. But also, again, there are, there are tech alternatives that are coming here. I mean, we already look at quite a lot of advances on, on artificial meat, for example, which mean that even if people are eating meat in the future, it may not necessarily be produced in the way that we've been producing it in the last few years. And I think, um, so I think it's fascinating that argument, but I think we've got to be careful not to just look at this through a middle-class Western. No, uh, you're right, Dan. So I'm really happy you raised that point and you're right. This is what you would see already if you looked at China the past decade and their, their consumption of meat has really increased, yeah? Um, and who are we then to blame, right? Because we in the Western world have done this for many years and now suddenly we're telling them not to do so. But there's also something in that where we as marketers have a job, we need to watch out that why does development mean eating more meat? Yeah, we created something like that because we placed meat on that hierarchy level as in that's the ultimate proposition. Yeah. Um, and luckily in many of these developing markets, we actually see that their diet is already much more plant-based. If you look at India, their meat consumption is already significantly less. And what we need to make sure is that we we don't create that aspirational kind of, you know, once you make it, you're able to afford yourself meat. We need to make sure that there are other propositions which are just as enjoyable or maybe more aspirational right, to disembark that. But I'm, but I'm totally with you. I think it would be strange to say that would not be allowed. Yeah, but we need to make sure that we reduce the mix. Um, and, and I think that could be done even if other regions would increase their diet on that sense. We can still come to that third by, you know, the, that that you know, it's funny that we call that the, the developed world, um, but that's where the where, that's where the biggest change needs to happen, yeah, because that's where the majority of the consumption is taking place. Yeah, a fair call out. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I think I think everything that you guys have mentioned have been very on point, and just to add on that, because I feel like, for example there are a lot of uh, livestock these days. And if we were to cut out meat from our diet completely, what will be the outcome of all the cows and all the food that goes into feeding these cows, for example? That's something that I've had in mind before. Um, but at the same time, I know there's a lot of new food and drink entrepreneurs making plant-based meat. And I think that is part of the future. But at the same time, will meat completely 
disappear or consumption of meat completely disappear. I, I'm not sure. And, and that goes to because there's still so many livestock currently in place and farmers that take care of these cows and chicken, for example. And if we were to cut out completely, what will happen to these animals? And that's a question for everyone as well. <laughs> Can I just add also on that? It's not just the animals. I mean, of course, the animals also graze a significant proportion of the land, particularly on uplands and, and hill environments. Uh, the grazing that they do provide a big environmental uh, benefit as well. So there's that challenge as well if those animals uh, are being taken off the land for meat and, and for dairy, for example. Uh, we, we will have an environmental issue there. Yeah, they play a, a critical role for the biodiversity. Yeah. Um, but we've taken it way beyond that. That's one of the questions that we also have in the chat and we will slowly moving into that direction of, of our session. Um, do you think the shift to plant-based diets will be a, a boom, a trend, or a bane for biodiversity? Might it increase crop monoculture or introduce more diverse crops to meet consumers' demand? Look, it's definitely a trend and it's going to stay. Um, you know, I, I have no hesitation on that. Um, it can be accelerated like, you know, COVID did, um, like the right kind of initiatives would do in terms of, you know, governmental policies, etc. cetera. Um, the fact that, you know, big uh, uh, quality service restaurants are, are serving more and more of this. It's making it more accessible. People can try it. They like it. They, they can repeat. Um, if we don't watch out, it will indeed, you know, impact biodiversity if negatively, yeah? Currently, soy is one of the most used um, uh, uh, agricultural crops to, uh, to deliver plant-based propositions because of the structure, um, you know, the closeness, that, uh, the, the, the resemblance that it gives. And we need to make sure that we build in that diversity from the start. Yeah? Otherwise, we're, 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 we are not going to make it. So I think that's where we also need to make sure that we take our responsibility and say, actually, we can't be one crop dependent, not from a resilience perspective, but also not from a... Uh, agricultural perspective. So we need to actively drive that. Um, and we're doing a lot of research in that space. Yeah? So trying to find alternative plant-based proteins that you know, give the taste, that give the texture experience, that give the safety. Yeah? You know, you, you ideally also want to have food that is able to, you know, not everybody likes day fresh, but we cannot feed 8 billion people with day fresh produce on an affordable level. It's not going to fly. Yeah? So you're going to have to use, let's say, processed food in a way in order to make it food accessible and, uh, uh, and affordable for, uh, for everybody everywhere. Um, and we need to make sure that we build that in. Otherwise, we'll just repeat, you know, what history did 50 years ago, but then now on a plant-based diet. Yeah, it'll help, but it's not going to be good enough. <laughs> but you see it already. Yeah? If you look now in your supermarket, you will find that, you know, there are already propositions that are calling out, this is made from pea. Um, you know, so this is made from fungi. This is, you know, th th there are already different propositions coming there and that awareness is rising. Yeah. Um, but we need more of it. Yeah. Definitely. It's much more visible and in the sense of supermarkets, but also in restaurants and, and places that you go and uh, either eat out or, or take away or so on. And mm -hmm. things are being fully vegan or fully plant-based. And this is definitely something that, is more and more visible everywhere. Yeah, yeah I think for example, yeah. the Impossible Burger, which is now at Burger King as well, I think that's a show that is becoming more and more mainstream. And one of the reasons that people try the Impossible Burger is because it, it reacts similarly to meat, like, like actual meat, and it kind of bleeds when you bite into it. And I think that's what Robert had mentioned earlier, where, you know, make it tasty, make it seem like, you know, it's enjoyable and more and more people from the mainstream market will buy into this and move towards more plant-based diet. I'd just come in there as well. I think what the Impossible Burger has done for food is a bit similar to what Tesla has done for electric cars. Because prior to Tesla, electric cars were not very attractive or sexy or, or aspirational put it that way and then tesla come along and suddenly make uh, electric cars aspirational suddenly something that everyone has a buzz about wanting to to have and i think impossible burger have done a similar thing uh and i think um actually that shows the way you can make transitions 
you know, it actually needs to be consumer focused and consumer led rather than being driven from above. Uh, and I think we're seeing that, um, but it's the entrepreneurs who are going to be the ones who actually drive this change. On that note, we are, we are talking about things that are, are coming up into the market, um, impossible meat and so on. They are all processed foods. And uh, we also have questions, and this is huge in the, in the sense of a huge debate in processed foods um, sphere. Are the processed foods, they are all processed foods, but lots of young people see processed foods as bad. Um, so are they? Do we consider them as, um, as safety, as, uh, as nutritious as all other uh, foods that we would cook at home? And also, will they play a, a role in the transition to more sustainable food systems? Look, let me, um, I think they are a critical part of the food solutions that we need to provide. Yeah? Um, like I said, there's a very romantic image on, you know, we're able to grow everything in our own garden and, you know, we have fresh produce every day. Um, but, you know, the mathematics of it won't work. We're already with too many people on earth in order to, to, to keep that. Yeah? So, and even if you go back in history, humankind has, you know, taken measures to preserve food. Yeah. I think w the industry has not done itself a favor by calling it processed. Process is something very negative. It feels chemical. It feels mm -hmm. little around with. And I think for the right reasons, we've also created that image because things were indeed, you know, put into the food where you could afterwards, you could say, was that really necessary? Could that not have been on a different way? But the thinking of processing food so that you can keep it for a moment that, you know, maybe the crops are not coming from the land because it's winter time, but you still need to have the diet. That's where you need these kind of foods for us, yeah? Um, you need to have processed foods in order to have it affordable, yeah? Um, in order to be able to, you know, put a quick meal on the table because you just got out of work, you know, you need to go somewhere else again or the kids need to go to sports, you know, all these kind of things. So that's where this comes to play a role. But we need to make sure that we then do it in a way that we can be proud of our food and that we are enhancing the value rather than destroying the value out of it. Yeah? Um, and there are examples on both cases, but I think the worst that we can do is that we think that we can do completely without, because I don't think that will work, yeah? at least not for the large majority that, um, that also has a right to, uh, to food. Yeah, I think there's a huge misconception on what processed foods are as well. So I think that's... Yeah, let's be honest. The aspects to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's been many cases indeed where the amount of sugar, the amount of salt, um, and that's where transparency uh, needs to come in. Um, and luckily, consumers are becoming more demanding in that sense. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, even these meat replaces that we were just talking about, you know, it's also good to... To, to be conscious and say, okay, so what is now in this meat replace? So what is making it, yeah? Um, and, and, you know, if we really want to make this plant-based transition successful, we need to make sure that these meat replacers are not too high on salt, that they still fit in the five grams of daily intake, yeah? Um, the same about preservatives that we use, yeah? And there's nothing wrong with preservatives if we're using preservatives that are, you know, tested, that are natural, you know, there, there is ways that we can preserve food, but we need to watch out that we, overdo things um, because then the perception actually will destroy more than and that they're trying to contribute in that light. So it's a very fine line. Yeah? It is. And there's also a question about transparency, which I think it leads, I mean, comes here quite nicely, uh, especially a question from Maya that uh, millennials especially demand uh, transparency. They want to know what's in their plate and how it is produced and where it comes from. Do you see this as a long lasting trend? and How do you respond to it? Absolutely. I think transparency is here to stay. I think that's also a good thing that the fact that everybody can now broadcast um, is making transparency much more important, right? So, you know, everybody who finds a fact can now bring that out and, 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 and shout to it. It also brings a risk because not everybody is an educated nutritionist, right? So there are also differences between facts and opinions. And sometimes we see facts being broadcasted and, and being used to challenge, which I think is good. And sometimes you see 
fiction being broadcasted and that's very difficult to then stand against yeah so we need to make sure that there is you know academic work being done that says okay what are the latest learnings and insights and 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 how do we make sure that that is the education that drives the decision and not only based on on fiction or feelings because sometimes that actually people think they're doing the better sustainable choice and let me give you you know people disembarking on plastic packaging because plastic is bad which is the case if it ends up in environment but then they start to use glass but if you do that i can tell you one thing the carbon dioxide is going to go through the roof because glass is being recycled really well but it's using a lot of thermal energy so you know we also need to really make sure that we are taking things through the full lens of things and not only looking at one aspect yeah um, and that's difficult because also things change science develops what was not possible today is suddenly possible yeah um, and, and and that's where we I, you know, I hope that the young people will also remain curious and not only repeat what's being shouted but validate and if they agree then continue to shout yes I think also trust um, if you want trust of consumers in new technologies and new ways of doing things and novel foods and all of these things you need to have complete transparency they need to those consumers who want to know need to be able to know exactly at the point of purchase what they're buying. I think this is, you know, this is an argument that we've had quite a lot over the last 20 years in the European Union over genetically modified food, for example, um, where the EU is, you know, a long way behind the rest of the world, which has, you know, taken biotech in, in food uh, pretty widely over the last 15, 20 years, and the EU has still resisted most of it. Um, and part of the problem with that is because people are worried, um, they're not entirely sure what's in the food, and they also want to make sure that if they want to avoid this type of food, they can actually avoid it. So the only way I think that you're going to build all of these new approaches for, for food is actually fully labeling everything, giving that full transparency, and let consumers make the choice for themselves. Because without that, you'll always have a bit of a fear of the new stuff that's coming in. Yeah, and just to add on that, because for example, as a founder, I wanted to show traceability in my ingredients. So all the ingredients that we source are ethically sourced, so from fair trade organic farms. And I also show that on my labeling because I want the customers to be comfortable and know that when they buy a product from us, is buying from also a quality farm, like quality ingredients, and also the people are getting paid a fair price. And I think consumers today do care about this traceability. And another thing that uh, Robert and Dan were talking about earlier around like sustainability. So for example, I started with glass bottles and then I thought about using Tetra Pak, for example, next. And then I ended up with can. And it went, so I looked at all the carbon emissions from all the different types of packaging and I didn't look at plastic because in the UK, uh, plastic is seen as something that is uh, negative, bad for environment, and consumers don't like buying things that are plastic if they are uh, sustainability minded. But actually plastic, if recycled, is actually very good. So it just depends on the recycling system. And glass, yes, it, it is reusable, but if it's just broken down to make more glass, it actually uses a lot of water and electricity, which is what I discovered later on. And the aluminum, of course, also uses energy. And But however, in the UK, aluminum is one of the most recycled because I think people are used to this type of packaging and they feel like it's recyclable and they usually recycle cans. So that's what I end up with now. And also it's lighter. So for transportation wise, it emits less emissions. So there's a lot of things to look about in the whole logistics and supply chain. But I think businesses today are looking to be more sustainable. Yeah, and I think that also goes with education, right? People should be educated of what is what and what is better for the environment, especially now with a huge uh, interest in climate change and, uh, and sustainability. We should be educating also the consumers of what is, what is better for the environment. I'm very conscious of time, and I know we have five minutes left, and there are still a lot of questions there. Um, and I'm... Uh, one that I would like to ask one by one, uh, what is your prediction on the next big thing in the agriculture and food market? Uh, if you can 
give us your your insight, thoughts, or prediction. Well, one that that um, I hope at least will will be a big thing is indeed carbon footprint. Uh, you know, and, and the transparency on that, and um, because that is one thing that we really need to get under control. Uh, and again, you know, I mean, many companies have have, have made uh, commitments in that space. We we have said that we want to become carbon neutral. Um, the Green Deal has, of course, you know, the European Union has taken a big stand on that. Um, and this has a big impact yeah, on what we eat in our food system. Um, so I think, you know, more transparency on this and more conscious choices to make sure that producers take the right responsibility, but also consumers are able to shift demand. Uh, and with that also, you know, make that change. Um, I'm betting this will be a big, a big thing uh, that's coming at us. Yeah? Um, and I hope so, because it's needed. Will you see more carbon neutral products on the market, Robert? Yes, yes, we will see that. And again, I think we have to watch out that we want to move immediately to zero. Um, I think that is definitely where we need to go. But it starts with already, you know, being better than what we have today. Yeah. Um, but that should be definitely be the case. And I'm not, I'm not interested in where people, let's say, use, you know, the rights to, to equalize. That's not carbon neutral, right? That's just using somebody else's, uh, you know, uh, efforts. It is really making it carbon neutral by design. Yeah. Um, and, and we do believe that that is possible. Um, it will take some further interventions. Um, we know what the first steps will look like. We don't know what the last steps will look like, but you know, we'll take our time, um, you know, but we need to progress in that space. Yeah. Now, what about you? I will also link it with another question about what kind of other plant-based milk will be trending in the near future. Yeah, in terms of plant-based milk, there are so many types that have popped up in recent years. One being soy, there's um, almonds, there's all kinds of nuts like macadamia nuts. And recently I saw there's pea milk as well, made from peas. And who knows what type of milk will be next, but I think having that diversity will also allow us to have more plant-based diets and allowing the environment to also have biodiversity. So we're not only drinking soy milk, we're not only drinking oat milk, although oat milk is one of the most popular ones now, that with Oatly really leading that oat milk uh, movement. But having more diversity in plant-based milk is also better for the environment. So I see more and more different types of options coming up. And I think that's only for the better. And then what is your prediction for the for the next future uh, for the next food trends? I mean, I, I think that the, the key trend will be the digital revolution will hit the food industry. Um, because you see the way it's, it's been going through all of these other industries, the food industry is coming. Uh, and I think that's hugely exciting on a lot of ways. Now, when that's how food is produced, um, I was talking a little bit about artificial meat, whether that sort of type of uh, thing develops. I think as a result of that, you also start seeing more customization uh, of food and food products. Uh, you know, consumers, I think, are already beginning to start wanting more customization. Um, and I think, I think that's the way forward. I mean, just from a European perspective, the one thing that I hope uh, is that that leads to a more uh, sort of tech orientated policy on, on, um, on agriculture in general. So, you know, we, we look again, maybe at things like the precautionary principle, which I think challenge innovation a little bit in Europe uh, and that Europe can actually be at the forefront of this. But for me, it's gonna be the tech revolution uh, that's really gonna hit the food industry. And it's, I think it'll be fascinating you know, the changes that it makes to it. Wonderful, thank you very much. I know we are reaching now four o'clock uh, or three o'clock or any other o'clock in any other places in the world. Um, it's time to close the, the, this session and uh, um, apologies to those who, whose questions couldn't be answered. Perhaps that's an opportunity to have another of these uh, discussions because I think it was hugely interesting and very important and very relevant um, uh, at the moment. So I would really want to thank uh, Robert, Tina and Dan for joining me today and for the TFF for organizing this event as well as Food Drink Europe for, for making it all happen as well. Uh, it was a great, great pleasure to, to have uh, 
70 something people at some point with us today and i really hope that we can we can chat again soon and see what the future of food brings especially in terms of uh, trends led by millennials and generation z so thank you very much everyone uh, i'm wishing everyone a, a great day evening night afternoon and uh, see you next time thank you bye